Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's episode of Profound States, where my lighting has suddenly changed, and uh, it's weird. Let me see if I can. Yeah, there we go. Well, weird. Anyway, um, I don't know how that happened. It still looks like crap. Oh, that's where. Oh, no wonder the light is coming from my other source. There we go. All right. How bizarre. All right. That's good enough for now. Anyway, uh, welcome to tonight's show. Sorry, I'm not quite as professional as I should be. Tonight we have uh, on Profound States, Les Velez. Uh, Les, welcome to the show. Uh, his, he, I'm gonna just read his bio. Uh, he's a graduate at the University of Vermont with a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration. Uh, in September, beginning in September of 1970, he served in the Army as a field artillery officer before retiring from, uh, before retirement, he was the vice president of Luscombe Engineering, a Silicon Valley based manufacturers representative company. He joined MUFON, uh, the Mutual UFO Network in 91 and was held, has held the following positions, field investigator, training coordinator, for field investigators, the assistant state director in Northern California, chairman of the AERC Abduction Experiencer Research Committee, precursor to the MUFON ERT, which is the Experiencer Research Team, I assume that's current, and team leader of the ART, Abduction Response Team, associated with the AERC. Also during this time, he became a facilitator for an abduction support group in San Jose, California, and in 1994, co-founded OPUS, the Organization for Paranormal Understanding and Support, which is www.opusnetwork.org. In 2009, um, he presented at the MUFON Symposium in Denver on the proper conduct while investigating alien abductions. He appeared on Coast to Coast AM with George Knapp, and Open Minds Radio with Alejandro Ross and Linda Moulton Howe. Uh, and I guess that was on Phenomenon Radio on KGRA. Uh, his cell phone number is here, but I'm not giving that out. I don't think he wants me to give that out on the air. So uh, welcome to tonight, welcome to not to tonight's show, Les Velez. How are hey, you? Hey, good. How are you? Thank you for good. having me. Uh, it's really odd, my lighting. Uh, welcome, welcome. Uh, thank you. For well, it looks more. It looks more mysterious this way. You know, you, 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 you know, it's not bad. Not bad at all. <laughs> it's well, just a little darker. <laughs> I tell you what. Let's see if we can fix it quickly and easily. Uh, That looks pretty good. All right. So anyway, welcome and uh, let's get started. So did you, um, what was the first organization you were ever involved with that had to do with UFOs? Well, it had to be MUFON, uh, but it, it, it goes back before that where I actually had a sighting when I lived in Connecticut, uh, when I was like, uh, <clears throat> a preteen, and uh, this object was hovering over a tree line, and it scared the crap out of me. And I went and in, went into the house to try to get my father to come out to see this thing. And uh, by the time he came out, it was gone. And he says, "Oh, it was probably just a beacon of light reflecting off a cloud." And I said, "Well, you know, I didn't really believe that." And so I went to the library soon thereafter and started to read books on UFOs and. Those at, the, at that time in the late 50s, uh, George Adamski was the uh, preeminent uh, ufologist, if you will. And uh, so I really got into his books. And uh, 
you know, after a while, it kind of just faded uh, for me. Uh, I had no further sightings or anything and uh, didn't belong to any organization at that point. Uh, since there really wasn't any organizations at that point uh, that were, uh, you know, uh, a nationwide type of a thing until 1969 when MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, was uh, uh, founded. And uh, so I went off to college and uh, went into the ROTC, the Reserve Officer Training Corps, uh, uh, became a second lieutenant uh, in the artillery uh, division. And uh, soon thereafter, got married, um, spent six years in the service and, uh, you know, had a couple of children uh, and then moved out to California in 1985 and uh, picked up the San Jose Mercury News, as it was called in those days. And Stanton Freeman was coming to San Jose City College to talk about UFOs and the government cover up. And it was like somebody threw a switch. And I said, oh, my goodness, I have to go see this guy and listen to what he has to say. So I went there expecting to see a handful of people. Uh, but uh, the auditorium was packed. Uh, there must have been like 300 people there. And he gave one of his inimitable uh, presentations, lectures. And on my way out, there was a table in the foyer that uh, MUFON was manning. And uh, they were talking about the journal, the monthly journal that they produce. And so I decided that that would be something that I should should uh, look into. So I s signed up and uh, became a member and started to get the journal. And shortly thereafter, um, that wasn't enough for me. So uh, they also had a training course for field investigators. So I decided, OK, I'm going to do that. And I took the, uh, the course and I took the exam, passed it. And that's when things got very interesting. Uh, as I went out in the field with a more senior investigator, and the cases that we investigated, almost without exception, were not only sightings, uh, but they were also uh, instances of people saying that they've had contact with non-human intelligences, which really started to uh, be uh, quite interesting. and. You know, I was a kind of a nuts and bolts kind of a guy in the very beginning, and, and I wasn't really concerned about the abduction phenomena. And uh, but this had a whole different aspect to the investigation, and uh, really expanded my believability quotient, if you will, as far as what these people were saying. Because not only one person was talking about it. And, and saying very similar details, telling very similar details about their experiences, but it was happening time and time again. So, um, you know, so my, my career, so to speak, uh, in uh, working with uh, these abductees uh, started to expand significantly. And these people would ask me, you know, did I know of other people having similar circumstances? So the next thing I'm doing is I'm facilitating a support group in San Jose. And uh, and that's when really uh, things got interesting because I was hearing things that I'd never heard before uh, about these people's experiences. And they were quite significant and quite dramatic. And uh, you know, they were, you know, the initial stages of all of these things were, were, were quite uh, upsetting, quite traumatic. And uh, so it was a type of situation where eventually these people were looking for help and, and trying to deal with this phenomena. And so after a while, it became evident that, uh, you know, there was no organization out there at that point that was dealing with the abductees, the experiencers. And uh, I made a presentation to MUFON, uh, to the uh, uh, international director who at the time was James Carrion, um, and said, you know, you guys have been a nuts and bolts type organization, but you really need to start paying attention to these people that are having experiences because I think you're missing a lot of information. And so what started to happen was that phone calls that came in uh, to MUFON uh, were redirected to me. 
And so I started to get these phone calls, people looking for help with their experiences. And um, I had the capability uh, to do to that because in 1994, uh, a doctor friend of mine uh, and I had the experience, uh, I happened to be written up in a, uh, a an article in the Monterey Coast Weekly paper. Uh, a, a journalist there was looking to, to have some to talk to someone about UFOs and what's going on. And so he happened to contact MUFON and they, they directed him to me because I was I was kind of one of the closer investigators in the area. And this article was written up and shortly thereafter, I got a call from a woman that was also written up in, in the uh, article and saying that she was in contact with these off earthly entities and needed, wanted to know what was going on with her brain, their brain waves when she was in contact. And so I, you know, I thought to myself, well, I don't know how to possibly help this person, but uh, then she said she was working with an emergency room doctor down in Carmel. And so that that struck a note for me because I had a doctor friend, Dr. Eugene Lipson, that uh, was interested in contacting other ex- doctors in, uh, that are interested in the phenomena. So I called him up and I said, you know what, let's let's go down there and and talk to this lady and see see what's going on. So we decided to go down there one Saturday, and as we walked into her house. There was a picture on the wall, and in the picture, she was standing on the back of this rather large vessel and beautiful crystal clear water. I said, where are you? What is this picture all about? She says, oh, yeah, I'm down in the Caribbean, and I'm working with these treasure hunters. And I said, well, how are you helping these treasure hunters? And she says, well, I was in contact with the uh, captain of the galleon that had gone down. (laughs) So that started to uh, make the afternoon... uh, take a whole different, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, direction. And so she, uh, so she was a medium. She was very psychic. Yes. And what we found out was that after a near death experience that she had, she had become very psychic and she started to come into contact with all these entities. And so we had an incredible afternoon with her. Uh, she was telling us things about, um, ourselves that there was no possible way that she could she could know any of that you know because we've never had any contact with her and we came away and saying well how can we possibly help people like this and so that was the afternoon at this hamburger joint that we we decided that we need to come up with an organization and shortly thereafter in 1994 uh, we came up with the idea of opus the organization for paranormal understanding and support which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization recognized by the IRS. Um, and what we've done is we, we've set up various things to help people. And, and some of those things are, number one, we have a referral network of mental health practitioners and hypnotherapists. Uh, number two, we have an online, confidential online support group, uh, which we have over 300, almost 400 people now from around the world that are, conversing, talking to one another 24-7, talking about their experiences, asking questions. And then then we have the latest thing that we've added is what we call our EST, the Experiencer Support Team, which is a group of people that have tremendous amount of experience in working with people that have had experiences and un- trying to understand what it is that they're really looking for and, and how, how can we possibly help them. So it's, it's a triage type of a situation that we've set up. So anyway, that's 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 kind of it, and uh, the rest of it is just nuances as far as you know the various experiences that have gone on, the stories that people have talked about, and then uh, in in 2021, uh, late in that year, I came out with a book called The Unknown Other, and the Existential Proposition of Alien Contact, which goes over a lot of the types of things that these experiences are experiencing, whether it's physical, whether it's psychological. Uh, and then I talk about the government uh, involvement, uh, the military involvement. And uh, uh, it's, 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 it's a book that uh, 
if you don't know anything about this whole subject, it's a good book, uh, you know, uh, as a primer uh, for people that would like to know a, a little bit more about what's going on. So how many books have you written so far? Just, just one. Just, just one. one. Do you just have a copy one. of it with you? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I have one here. I got it all marked. I have it all marked up. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, I can see it. Yeah. Okay. Pull, yeah. No. Pull it, no. Pull it back a little bit. Yeah. Okay. A little bit more. A little bit more. A little more. A little more. Right there. Okay. okay. So the unknown okay. other and the existential proposition of alien contact. Right. Right. Yeah. So, um, you, how many? Uh, oh, let me put myself back in the picture. How many? Uh, how many people do you name? Uh, you know their stories. Everybody. Mm -hmm. How many? How many stories are there in the book? How many? Uh, there's about twenty-five. Twenty-five. How stories. many of those people are named? Uh, you know, have their full name in the book. Uh, there's probably about twenty-five percent of those people that uh, are named in the book. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, three quarters of them are anonymous. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And. Um, in a nutshell, what did you say about the government involvement in, in the story? In well, the I, I basically just, you know, did a reprise of the uh, the uh, UAP report that was done by the government uh, in uh, 2021, um, and uh, uh, which was, you know, there wasn't a wasn't a great revelation in there, other than the fact that they're saying, well, we're going to investigate these, and that out of the cases we looked at, 144, we couldn't figure out what they were, and uh, and, and so it was somewhat disappointing, obviously, uh, that there wasn't some more significant revelation about it. Uh, but I think you know the thing that uh, we all understand is that. It seems that what we're dealing with is is not terrestrial in nature. Certainly, it's not the U.S. It's not China. It's not Russia. Uh, and uh, so, then, what is it? You know, is it extraterrestrial? Is it interdimensional? Is it time travelers? Is it our military with some super secret uh, type of a situation? But it seems that. The military aspect is probably not a, 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 a good uh, possibility simply because of the fact that the way that they have interacted can be somewhat dangerous and it, it would not be uh, something that uh, I think, uh, you know, they would want to uh, uh, have uh, happen if there was an accident of some sort uh, because these things are going at such speeds and, and, and changing direction the way that they do, uh, that could cause an accident. And so I don't think they would want to out themselves in that way. So I don't think it's military. I, I think it's, it's either extraterrestrial, interdimensional, uh, or time travelers, well, or okay. anything else you can think of. So you have, tw did you say 25 people in the book? Is that what yeah. you said? Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, of the 25 stories, is there one person whose who's, um, name you use in the book whose story is, um, how shall I put it, they have more experience with more types of aliens or they're, they're you know, you understand the difference between uh, MUFON's historical uh, take on the whole scenario and how that doesn't always align with a lot of abductees' experiences because MUFON isn't, has never been historically a, a, an abductee-focused organization. You, you, pi you pioneered that within MUFON, so you understand the disconnect between the two, yes? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. So, is there a story? Is there a particular person whose set of stories comes to mind when you think of all the ones in the book that stands out above the others, or in some fashion different from the others, in the sense that they either are con in contact with more aliens, or more types of aliens, or uh, or 
maybe they've been, say, taken on board more often or they've gone to higher dimensions with the, you know, is there anybody who story you believe who you've put in the book, but yet their story is uh, kind of unique even among those you put in the book? Yeah, I think that uh, the the person that I will call Adam um, is is probably the story that is one of the lengthiest in the book and the uh, most uh, uh, explicit as far as the types of experience that he's had and the revelations that he's had and they've been pretty much positive um, uh, for him um, and, and that the aliens talk about reincarnation and that it's a universal norm that this is something that goes on it's a, that's the process that the universe goes through um, and um, the uh, so his his experiences have been somewhat positive, um, and uh, I think the majority of people, like seventy to eighty percent of the people that have had these experiences, you know, do not want them to stop. Uh, and so you have that minority that are having what you would call more negative experiences. Uh, for whatever reason, but I think the reason behind a lot of this is the same reason why we have good people here and uh, bad people here on our our plane, if you will. And the same thing is true that's going on, you know, up there, if you will. That uh, there's there's good ones and there's bad ones, and so sometimes you get involved with the good ones and. Sometimes you get involved with the bad ones and and what their agendas are, are, are just, uh, you know, uh, quite different. So your your view on the topic in general sort of mostly or completely aligns with the the um, view that free came up with. The the uh, the yeah. position. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And then this is something that uh, you know, our my organization Opus has done a study that goes back to 2007, where we took 71 people that were uh, claimed to be experiencers and uh, uh, 51 people that uh, were a control group. And uh, let let me just read. This was a study that was actually funded by MUFON. And uh, and uh, so I had, was tasked with putting together a team to look at this. And I, I got two psychologists to help me with this project. And let me just let me just read what the results were of, of that uh, study. In general, abductees experiences profile differently than do their experiential counterparts on a number of general psychological and specific neuro neurological variables. Yet there are remarkable similarities between the experiential group and the comparison group. It should be noted that in no case did experiencers or comparison group participants show any signs of mental illness or personality disorder. So there was no psychopathology involved with this, which a lot of debunkers claim. Fantasy proneness does not appear to play a differentiating role between the experiential and the control groups. However, sensitivity to alternative realities and early and recurrent paranormal or psi experiences seem to play a role in the abduction experience. Childhood conflict, psychosocial tension, and abuse and trauma more than likely facilitate a dissociative coping style in later life. How much a part dissociation plays in the abduction experience remains an open question. And this does not mean that, again, it's, it's, it's a psychopathology, but it's, it's a way of handling the situation because of the trauma or stress that people are having, and it seems to open them up. Both experience with and interest in the abduction phenomena have impact on one, how one uh, 
body is perceived to function and how one views the world and one's purpose in it and how one defines or redefines one's faith, tradition, and beliefs. In essence, both experience with and interest in contact seem to change one's sense of self and one's worldview. And one of the and really interesting things that come about after these experiences is that the majority of people come away with the fact that we need to be better shepherds of the planet. We need to be better to one another. We need to be more loving. I mean, these are all very positive things that go on. Abductees experience to believe that there is a sentient, purposive alien intelligence at play in their lives and at work in the world. What these intelligence goals are uh, seem to be more beneficent than malevolent, more benign than malignant. This, of course, remains an open question. The brain generally and the temporal lobes and limbic system more particularly play a mediating role in the anomalous experiences such as abduction. This in no way implies that abductions are all or only in the abductee's heads. Rather, it points to the likelihood of the temporal ability um, uh, per a set of precursor or t uh, to extraordinary experiences. While it would be reductionistic to claim that the brain creates th such experiences, it's not far-fetched to think that the brain plays an important part in who and the what of extraordinary experiences. So uh, there, there's <laughs> there's a lot going on there, and uh, the the uh, you know the. Looking at the brain, uh, and uh, you know, Gary Nolan from Stanford University has done some studies along with Kate Green from the CIA uh, on people, and there, there's interesting uh, parts of the brain, the caudate and putamen area, where there's a lot more connections in these people that seem to have psychic abilities uh, and uh, be and be, are able to telepathically uh, communicate. Uh, so is that something that that is happening because of uh, you know it's the old chicken and the egg did they did they mess with our uh, dna you know you know eons ago and that there's they're st still following these people or is this something that's that's coming about uh, naturally but i think uh, based on gary nolan's experience it seems like it it, it was uh, created uh, eons ago that uh, our, our, our DNA was manipulated. Uh, it, it's, it's, there's so much to this phenomena that uh, once you go down the rabbit hole, it, it, uh, it has so many, so many different aspects to it that uh, we don't understand. We don't have the answers. All right, well, um, let's, let's, See if we can contrast and uh, and uh, compare different viewpoints and and uh, maybe piece this out a little bit. So, um, on one side you have Free, who's talking that most uh, most experiencers want it to continue. Right. Now, I don't I don't doubt uh, what they're saying in any way, shape, or form. But let's go to the other side. Uh, you've got somebody like, uh, you know, Daryl Sims is, of course, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So him being abductee himself and also somebody who's been researching implants and uh, abductees in some fashion for quite a while, he's considered by many people to be an expert. Now, on his side, He's he kind of looks at he's a uh, a Christian and he looks at uh, aliens as being in league together all as a more of a uh, single unit and not positive in the slightest. And I heard a interview of him very recently where uh, he was talking about uh, the mass abduction event that he was a, a lot of his people were a part of. And uh, in that interview, he was saying that uh, the alien in a particular event was, or the head alien, I should say, the head person in the room. And he said there was all, all the different aliens were there, including Sasquatch and so forth. But the head guy who came in last was pointing at uh, a human and asking, 
uh, the, the person who was abducted, where is the soul in the body? Now, if you look at, there are, um, there were a couple of different videos that Linda Moulton Howe did where um, there was a fellow who was a, uh, he was, I don't know what his rank was, but he was uh, a sergeant or something, some rank in the army or something like that. And he was working at the underground NSA facility in, I think it was Hawaii. And he was saying that um, he was overhearing other people talking and they were saying that, the, that they were listening to the aliens and the aliens were talking about how to get uh, to control or capture our soul. So you've got uh, Linda being a, a uh, one of the premier researchers in the field, and Daryl being a premier researcher in the field, and they're both saying that the aliens are very interested in our soul, like like they don't have one. And you know, and I've heard, like the other day, I heard uh, somebody, uh, or actually it was just yesterday, the day before, I was listening to a guy who I don't necessarily need to name him, but he was channeling an alien, and they were. The alien was a gray, just happened to be a gray, and the gray was saying, of course we have souls. And so you have all, you have um, some of the most premier alien researchers who are highlighting or believing that the aliens are after our soul, where you've got a huge number of people on your side who are saying that, no, 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 they're not bad at all. Most of them are good. So. How do you personally square these two scenarios? Yeah, well, I, I think that the, the the situation that people are having, certainly in the beginning, is traumatic. And uh, if, you, if it was only one experience that they were having, uh, they would probably like it to stop. However, these things don't generally only happen once, that they continue on, and that there, it's a process. It's, it's a process that, that starts to happen where eventually they become uh, accustomed to what's going on and they become more relaxed about the situation. And then after a while, uh, they become very accustomed to it and want it to continue. And then when it stops, it's like the Stockholm Syndrome where uh, people start to wonder, well, why is it stopping? Why aren't they coming back for me? Um, but the statistics show that uh, the majority of people, when they've had multiple experiences, tend to uh, be of the camp that, yes, it's OK, I want it to continue. And so it's only that smaller minority that continue to have bad experiences for whatever reason because of their experiences and they want it to stop. Um, so and as far as the soul is concerned, uh, you know, we can talk about the soul, we can talk about consciousness, we can talk about all of those kind of things, but the bottom line is that these these entities, for whatever reason, um, seem to uh, exhibit various things. I mean, some of them are just totally cold, no personality, no feelings, no nothing, and then others seem to exude like uh, the the mantis type uh, who seem to be in charge uh, in many cases. Uh, you know, the grays are, are like the uh, iPhone of the universe. I mean, it's like all, all the different races seem to use grays to do their dirty work, and they go to a store and say, okay, I want t two grays to come with me, and I'm going to have them uh, abducted people, uh, and so it's 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 uh, it's amazing. And so anyway, but people often talk about the the mantis type being in charge and exuding some kind of compassion, some kind of a of a feeling that uh, you know they're concerned about what's going on. Um, so you know, again, as, as far as the soul is concerned, what the hell is the soul? You know, define the soul, <laughs> you know? And, and so I think you have to be very careful when you start talking about that. What does that really mean? You know, 
Is it the way you think? Is it the way you feel? Is it, you know, something beyond that? Um, I, I don't have a definitive answer for that. <clears throat> well, um, have you, have you, uh, do you watch YouTube videos? Yes, I do. So did, ha have you seen many of those, the, in, uh, the NDE videos like Jeff Marr does and some of the, a bunch of the others do? Have you listened to the, watch those? Well, I think I think as far as you know, NDEs, uh, you know that that's an incredible thing. I mean, you know, I've heard many stories uh, about people that have had near death experiences, and the fact that they meet uh, these entities that uh, seem to be very loving, and uh, that they want to go with them, but then they they're told, "Wait a minute, you you can't go. You have things that you have to do," and then they're they're told something on top of that. Um, there was a case of a, a doctor, a woman doctor who was on a uh, kayaking uh, trip down in South America and she went over a falls and got trapped at the bottom of the falls for over a half an hour. And during that time, she, she, she saw these entities and they, they were very loving and they, 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 she wanted to go with them and they said, no, you can't go. You have things that you're going to do. And then they told her that her son, who was a young boy at the time, would tragically die when he when he turned 18. <clears throat> so she kind of forgot about that and uh, never said anything to her son. And when he turned 18, it was soon thereafter he got into a car accident and died. So what is, what is that all about? I remember the story you're talking about. Um, <clears throat> What I the reason why I brought that up is because I had a specific question I wanted to ask you. I was wanting to get your take on it, and that is uh, okay. So I've heard quite a few of those stories, and um, and many of them they go into heaven and then they're looking around in heaven and they see people and occasionally they might see animal pets, but. Um, I've never heard an indie story where they go to heaven and they see aliens of any kind. Pick any alien you can think of. Uh, they don't see those. They're only humans. And so I listened to one particular fellow. I'm trying to think of his name. He's supposed to be an expert on uh, some of the greys and being very much in contact with them. And he was saying that when the aliens die, they go to a different realm than we do. So uh, I don't necessarily know that expect you to have any information in this area, but I just thought I would ask it just well, in most, case. Yeah, most, yeah. Of, most of the experiences that uh, people that have had NDs, uh, they talk about, you know, seeing, you know, relatives or they, they, they talk about seeing light beings, you know, this is, this is, something that's very common uh it, it's very difficult to to make out any anything you know in a physical form but it's a light being that they they just have a, a an incredible um uh attraction to uh be, simply because of this you know overwhelming love that seems to be exuding uh from them uh to them so uh but no i've i've never heard of uh uh, people seeing greys or mantids or rep reptilians or anything like that. Well, just the uh, okay. So you you do have people, uh, quite a few people who died, and they see, like you said, they see beings of light. They see higher level uh, beings that you might cons call an alien, but they're just higher level aliens, not not the physical lower level aliens, mm -hmm. the higher level light beings. OK, so uh, but even those you don't they don't see them a lot in, in heaven. They see them like right after they die. And then but the, when they get into heaven, you know, it's more just humans. And I'm I'm curious as if it if some of this is just made up, not made up as in fiction, but made up as in uh, as in you are a part of God. Therefore, you can create your own world over there and because you expect to see humans when you go to heaven there are humans in heaven and uh, because you're creating your own world not because it's a fiction 
And so that's just the idea that comes to my mind. But uh, I guess we should get back on uh, specifically things that you would know. And that is like, for instance, uh, all right, so um, we've decided that according to free and your, or, oh, is there anything uh, you have any pattern or uh, overall theme that you've come across in your own personal experiences that which diverges from MUFON's official uh, beliefs as in, uh, you know how they're more of a, okay, so let me put it this way. Um, if, um, since MUFON has started as a nuts and bolts organization and it has moved forward from there to eventually deal with abduction and if you listen to some of the abduction experiences, they can get pretty wild. And, uh, you know, as in some people are taken physically, some are taken astrally, some are taken both. And, you know, when you go into the higher realms, you have different dimensions, and then you have astral travel and all this stuff. A lot of these areas are way beyond MUFON's purview. And obviously being focused on abduction, you've already gone beyond their general purview because they're focused on lights in the sky. So uh, how has your, the fact that you have pushed the envelope with MUFON, how has that uh, changed, if, if at all, has it changed MUFON as an organization as a whole? Has it, has it changed them, do you think? Well, I think what, what they've, they've, created is the ERT, the Experiencer Resource Team, uh, headed up by George Medich and uh, previously headed up by Kathleen Martin and uh, Gwen Farrell. And um, they, uh, you know, their, their, their whole bailiwick is, is to work with people that are having these types of experiences. However, <clears throat> MUFON has rigorously uh, stayed away from quote unquote paranormal uh talking about the paranormal uh you know like sasquatch or, or uh, you know cryptids or, or things of that nature they they, they want to stay away from that um they want to try to keep it as confined as possible so their their um you know uh initial uh, charter was the nuts and bolts uh, type thing and now they've expanded because i think it, it's become so evident that th there's something else going on that they really need to pay attention to, uh, which, you know, I started to, you know, make them start thinking about it. And then eventually, you know, now they've got their own uh, organization set up to to do that, where they, they also have um, uh, mental health practitioners and, 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 and things of that nature and hypnotherapists to uh, to help people. Uh, so, uh, yeah, they've changed. They've, they've certainly changed and, uh, uh, and that, and that's a good thing, but, uh, they, they, they still have a problem with, uh, looking at the paranormal, which, you know, whether it's poltergeist activity, uh, Kundalini awakening, um, uh, things of that nature, uh, you know, demonic possession, uh, angelic, uh, possession, what have you. They, they, they are, they're a little bit reticent to go down that path. And so Opus, on the other hand, uh, is not. And so we, we, we look at those kind of things as well and are, are here to help people that are having those kind of situations. So if, um, if somebody like myself, who's a talented hypnotherapist who had has not had a practice open for many years, but used to be a talented hip or, you know, once you, you understand from, um, you must understand, I, okay, I guess the first question should be, are you a, a, a hypnotherapist? I'm sorry, what? Are you a hypnotherapist? No, I'm not. I, I do not, I do not uh, work with uh, the, uh, uh, the experiencers in that fashion. Uh, my my initial um, uh, 
process with with these people has been mostly a triage uh, type of a situation where I would find out what they're looking for. Are they looking for a hypnotherapist? Are they looking for a mental health practitioner? Uh, are they looking for a support group? Uh, and, and then being able to give them that kind of information. Uh, no, I've never I never uh, had a, a huge, you know, huge desire to to do that kind of thing because I'm I'm privy to a lot of these stories and and of course uh, if you take a look at my book you'll you'll see a lot of the stories that I ha have been privy to because on the support group side I monitor the support group side with it with uh, two other people so I I see everything that's coming in to the support group and read every every one of those things and uh, if there's something that comes up that I feel that uh, we need to address in some other fashion, then I, I jump in. But uh, I'm getting a lot of information coming my way. And so, uh, but to answer your question, no, I'm not a hypnotherapist. Well, let's get away from aliens just for a second, since Opus is, um, um, is obviously go gone beyond uh, aliens into the paranormal. So let's say somebody uh, comes to Opus and they say they have uh, attaching spirits. What would you tend to do for such, or what would you try to do for such a person? Well, for, first of all, you know, the conversation would have to, you know, be a little bit more in depth with these people. You would certainly talk to them and and, and get a feel for what's going on. You know, are are, are they are they you know taking drugs are they uh, have they gone to a psychiatrist or a psychologist and you know you have the standard type questions that you would want to ask them as far as that and once you get through all of that we do have people that we can we can uh, suggest that they uh, talk to uh, that are familiar with that type of a thing and how to deal with it uh, so uh, uh, we're very lucky in that regard that we do have that capability well uh, as I was st starting to get into a minute ago, I, I used to be into hypnotherapy, and I've worked with one abductee um, who was used as a breeder for the Greys. She figured she had uh, 72 encounters, 24, let's see, 48 abductions, 72 encounters, um, 55 offspring, and um, anyway, she's in my book, and but I was, I've always tried to uh, get in with MUFON. You, you remember, you know who uh, Peter Davenport is, right? Sure. Okay. Uh, I used to go to his New Fort meetings. So I've gone to MUFON meetings, HUFON meetings, mm -hmm. New Fort meetings, and others. And I've known uh, uh, John Schusler, he investigated. Mm -hmm. I'm a I'm a contactee myself. I uh, have never been abducted, but I've had a lot of uh, my share of contact. And uh, anyway, um, so with all these different organizations, I've never had luck with allowing any of them to work with their abductees. Uh, with Peter, he didn't trust me because he didn't he he gave all his uh, abductees to Yvonne Smith and uh, or and MUFON, uh, like for instance, the MUFON leader of the state of Georgia, where I'm at now, he trusts me, but he doesn't trust me in the sense that he's already got somebody, a, an older gentleman who's worked with hundreds of his abductees, so he's already got somebody, and that I think. Uh, um, uh, Kathleen Martin said that she made the statement this guy wasn't, I don't know if she said he wasn't qualified or he wasn't, uh, that MUFON didn't sanction him. or She said something like that, which mm -hmm. was, mm -hmm. kind, of, kind of startled me because this guy's the head of a state MUFON chapter and, and the guy he's using obviously knows what he's doing because you haven't heard any any stories of him getting sued, so obviously he's he's uh, at least minimally talented enough to do his job. But uh, um, anyway, 
I've just not had much luck in getting into uh, being able to do that with any organization over the years. And the only reason I was able to do it with the one client was because she came to me for back pain and obesity. And we, uh, oddly enough, were able to get her everything she needed in four sessions, uh, mm-hmm. or actually it was two sessions. And uh, I didn't even think that was possible, but she was able to get everything she needed done in two sessions. So I spent four sessions with her working strictly for free on abduction work and Mm -hmm. uh, research. And she actually paid me for one of those four sessions, even though I didn't ask for any money because Mm -hmm. she uh, got so much benefits out of it. But even though, so even even having had uh, a good history of talent with, um, with clients and uh, at least one abductee, I still don't qualify for uh, Opus or MUFON or New Fork, any of them, because they're either uh, very close to the vest with their abductees or they well, want you. Medic, Medic, George Medic wanted me to, what's his name? His last yeah, name? George, George Medic, yeah. Medic, yeah. He, uh, the head of MUFON said, oh, I asked the head of MUFON at that time, who's no longer in favor, you, you and I both know who we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, if I could work with abductees for MUFON, he said, sure. And then he passed me on to Kathleen and Kathleen goes, well, you need uh, all these qualifications. And I, I met most of them all except for the fact that I didn't have an open practice at the time. Mm-hmm. But then she passed me on to George. Mm-hmm. And George was like, uh, he wanted me to have like a medical degree almost, you know, and then have you ever applied to uh, Opus to to look at your credentials? No, y'all t- y'all turn me down too. So, really? Yeah, hmm. but uh, it's not the thing about hypnotherapy is that it's not. Um, how do I put this? I, I'm going to back up a second. I was just about to go here before you asked the question, but yep. I'm going to I'm going to go to Texas for a moment because I'm from Texas. Now, there was a uh, congressman in the state of Texas whose name I cannot remember off the top of my head, but he passed the law in the state of Texas without any without any go, uh, public feedback beforehand. And his law that is is the law in Texas now, unless it got struck down, uh, which I haven't heard such thing. But the law was you either are a lawyer you're a doctor, an MD, a doctor, uh, or a PhD, you're a a licensed drug counselor or licensed professional counselor. If you're not one of those five, you cannot legally work with anybody as a hypnotherapist in the state of Texas. Now, if you think about that, think about the 99.9999% of all the hypnotists out there, they're not lawyers, they're not MDs. They're not drug counselors. They're not professional counselors. Yeah. And what was the fifth one? Uh, uh, whatever that fifth one is, they're not that either. So he just outlawed a whole uh, stratus, a uh, huge chunk of the people who actually are the best at doing hypnotic regressions. The actual, the regular hypnotists are, who are not into any of those things. And so along those same lines, all of the organizations out there, including yours, want um, these extra tweaks that really have nothing to do with your talent as a hypnotist. And well, I think I think what it, what the reason is is that it's it's a it's a liability issue. Yes, uh, I know, I know. And, and and so when it when it comes right, you know, push and shove that, you know, we're trying to protect. Uh, our organization or any other organization and that's why they they want those kind of things like you have liability insurance and and things of that nature not that you're not a good hypnotherapist you know that that's that's a whole nother ball game but if if we're going to uh 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 you know give somebody uh a a name uh you know a referral uh then we need to be comfortable in that regard uh, unfortunately and you're right I, I i totally agree with you uh, you know 
and I, you know, I would love to, you know, have you on board, but uh, it, it's well, that kind of situation. Kathleen Martin gave me the same spiel uh, mm -hmm. in the sense that it's a liability thing, which I, you know, I can understand. I can understand that. So let's go down. Um, Sort of a side I, I, road. Just, yeah, I just want to give you a heads up that we're getting really close to about oh, five minutes. I so I've got to. I understand. So um, if you, uh, if a person like me wanted to get involved with Opus and, the, uh, you know, I can't do the hypnotic regressions because we've already established that mm -hmm. I don't meet the requirements. Uh, what other. Uh, as I'm as I'm also a, an experiencer, mm -hmm. obviously I could help people. Uh, at least t I could talk about it with them. Well, yeah, and I think we, what comes to mind is maybe to put you into the support group, to where well, you could you could you could monitor what people are talking about. You could uh, uh, you know give your opinion on uh, what's going on. Uh, especially being an, an experiencer yourself, and then with the uh, also with the uh, uh, the ability to uh, look at it from the uh, hypnotherapist point of view as well. Well, if you want to just take my name down and note me, uh... here here's what you do. Here's what you do. Go to our website, opusnetwork.org. Hit the hit the support button. Okay, and just just put in there that you want to be put into the support group. And then I'll I'll get you into the support group. Okay. Um, what do you want? What would you like to tell uh, the people um, who might be interested in getting your book or being sure. a part of the organization? Yeah. Uh, yeah what well, would you like to tell them yeah. about uh, anything that would tweak their interest uh, before we have to go? Yeah. Well, Charles, thank you very much, first of all, for, for having me here t uh, on your show tonight. And uh, I, I truly appreciate it. And I appreciate what you do, that you're trying to get the word out. And 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 uh, this is so important that people like yourself are, are you know, breaking these, these walls down, uh, you know, and talking about these kind of things, because it's happening. It's happening every day to a lot of people. As a matter of fact, my latest theory is the fact that we've all had experiences, whether we consciously know, know uh, this has happened or not. I mean, I've had a uh, tell you a quick story that a person in one of my support groups in San Jose told me, oh, I've seen you before. I said, where at a UFO conference? No, I saw you on board a craft. And I kind of, you know, blew it off. I didn't think much of it. And then it was a year and a half later that somebody said to me, he said, I've seen you before. And I said, where at a UFO conference? No, no, no. You were sitting on his bench naked on board the craft and you were freaking out. And they told me to go over to you to calm you down. So I went and started to get regressed. I had three separate regressions and never came up with anything along those lines, except that I had multiple past lives. And then somebody later told me, he says, well, maybe you were abducted in a past life which is now coming out. So anyway, the bottom line is that it, it's important. And, and I appreciate it again, uh, Charles, for people like yourself that are doing these kind of shows. So for people that are having experiences, I think, you know, we're, we're here to help. You know, we're, we're here to help you as best we can. And uh, the way we do that is through three means right now. We have an online confidential online support group where we have almost 400 people from around the world that are communicating 24 seven, asking questions, telling their stories. We have a referral network of mental health practitioners, hypnotherapists, uh, people of that nature. And then the latest thing that we've established is the EST, the Experiencer Support Team, um, that does triage. These are very experienced people that you can talk to when you contact us, and they'll find out exactly what you're looking for and uh, be able to give you the, you know, the help that you're, 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 you're looking for. So anyway, um, and, and all you need to do is go to our website, which is opusnetwork.org, opusnetwork.org and then also i came out with a book uh, almost now two years ago called the unknown other and the existential proposition of alien contact uh if you go to our website on our home page you'll see the picture of the book you can click on that it'll take you to amazon uh the the uh, hard uh, 
copy is like twenty dollars. The Kindle version is nine ninety nine, and if you're a Kindle Prime uh, member, it's free. <laughs> so, and all the, all the money that uh, comes in for the book goes directly to Opus. I don't take anything for it. This is, you know, this is my way of donating to the cause, which I think is so important. So again, Charles, thank you so much for having me on your show tonight. Um, where do you live? Where exactly do you live? Texas, Texas. And where in Texas? Allen, Texas, just northeast of Dallas. Ah, okay. Uh, I appreciate you being on the show. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Uh, it's, it's actually been quite interesting, more than I expected even. <laughs> and, uh, good. Thank good. you. Uh, I I think you've done a great uh, service uh, going beyond aliens with your organization. That the fact that you're dealing with the paranormal that that fact alone uh, says a lot about you. That you have an open mind, and uh, I really appreciate the fact that you've done that for the people. So uh, thank you again for being on the show. Let me stop the recording.